Um, hey everybody, we hope you, you gotta be a bit quieter please guys, Shh, keep it rolling, it's authentic, it's real, it's real. Jack, shh, thank you. Um, guys, hello, welcome, we hope you enjoy these videos, they are from um, our class reading the play, talking about the play, and we hope that they're helpful to you, yeah. Good luck Good with luck the externals. With the externals. <laughs> Folger Theatre at Folger Shakespeare Library presents Macbeth by William Shakespeare. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost, and one that will be ere the set of sun where the place upon the heath there to meet with macbeth i come gray malkin haddock calls anon fair is foul and foul is fair hover through the fog and filthy air Okay, let's have a quick look at that opening scene. We meet the three witches in Act 1, Scene 1, and we've got a device here known as Pathetic Fallacy, where the um, natural environment or the weather kind of reflects the mood of, of, a, of a text. So you'll notice throughout the play that every time the witches are there, um, there's thunder. They use their classic word hurly burly, which in, in essence really uh, is such a strong, unique word that sets up the premise of the entire play, essentially, that things will not be um, balanced, things will not be um, controlled. And they speak in kind of these paradoxical kind of word play phrases, you know, um, when the battle's lost and won. So straight from the beginning, the audience has to work kind of hard to make sense of how these witches speak. They agree to meet again. It's clear that they possibly have uh, the ability to see the future. They know they're going to meet Macbeth. They agree to meet back there. And we have, again, a, a, a phrase that sets up really the premise of the whole play in this topsy-turvy or hurly-burly kind of world where fair is foul and foul is fair. Things as you expect them to be will be turned on their head. So much so that they, Shakespeare uses this word hover again to further imply this kind of um, lack of um, balance um, or groundedness. Um, things will be uneven and off kilter and filthy air gives us that indication that things aren't going to go uh, too smoothly. It's going to get quite vulgar and violent. What bloody man is that? He can report as seemeth by his plight of the revolt, the newest state. This is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend. Say to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou didst leave it. Doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonald, worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him from the western isles of Kearns and Galloglasses is supplied, and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. Yeah, but all's too weak. For brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion, carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands, nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops, and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. As whence the sun gins his reflection, shipwrecking storms and direful thunders break, so from that spring whence comfort seemed to come, discomfort swells. Ah, mark! 
King of Scotland's mark. No sooner justice had, with valor armed, compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord, surveying vantage, with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Dismayed not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo? Yes, as sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. If I say sooth, I must report they were as cannons, overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe, except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha. I cannot tell. Ah! But I am faint. My gashes cry for help. So will thy words become thee as thy wounds... They smack of honor both. Go, get him, surgeons. Who comes here? The worthy Thane of Ross. What a haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Whence camest thou, worthy Thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict, till that Bologna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit. And to conclude, the victory fell on us! Yeah! Great happiness! That now Sueno, the Norway's king, craves composition... Nor would we deign him burial of his men till he dispersed it at St. Columns Inch ten thousand dollars to our general use. No more that thane of Caldor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go, pronounce his present death, and with his former title greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. Excellent. Uh, quite an energetic scene here. Um, in that final part of it, we've got King Duncan um, making Macbeth is going to be the new uh, Thane of Cawdor as a result of his brave fighting in this latest battle. Um, Notice that they've called the original Thane of Cawdor a traitor, which kind of reflects the time that this play is written, where we we did have really um, quite a few assassination attempts on the king. So, uh, you know, we had the Elizabeth uh, and her sister Mary had tensions. So the idea of disloyalty is really on the minds of the audience at the time. So the original Thane of Cawdor was obviously disloyal and, of course, the brave, the brilliant uh, Macbeth and Banquo, our captains here, they are asked, were they scared in battle? And they, absolutely not. They absolutely doubled down, overcharged with double cracks. So they were unswayed and, un and certainly not afraid. And Macbeth starts the play off with these phenomenal reviews. I mean, people calling him brave. He deserves that name. And you can see he's quite a violent guy. I've always thought that line was excellent. Unseamed him from the knave to the chaps. This would mean that <laughs> Macbeth is obviously quite skilled with the sword and is able to slit somebody from their knave, their, their belly button, to their chaps, which means their bottom jaw. So straight up the middle. I think that's all for that scene. Let's keep rolling. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I, a right be you, witch, the rump-fed Runyon cries. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger, but in a sea I'll thither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do I'll do, and I'll do. I'll give thee a wind. 
that kind. And I another. I myself have all the other, and the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know in a shipman's card. I'll drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man forbid. Weary seven nights, nine times nine, shall he dwindle, peak and pine. Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest tossed. Look what I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb, racked as homeward he did come. A drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. The weird sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus to go out, about, thrice to thine, and thrice to mine, and thrice again to make up nine. Peace. The charms wound up. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is called to forest? <laughs> what are these? So withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are aunt. Live you? Or are you aught that man may question? You seem to understand me by each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women, and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak, if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to the thane of glams. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to the thane of Cawdor. All hail, Macbeth, that shalt be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are you fantastical, or that indeed which outwardly you show? My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped withal. To me, you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. Hail! 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 Lesser than Macbeth and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get king. Though thou be none. So all hail, Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers, tell me more. By Sinel's death I know I am Thane of Gloms, but how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives, a prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, or why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting. Speak, I charge you. The earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air, and what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind. Would they had stayed... Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we eaten on the insane route that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. You shall be king. Uh, and Thane of Cawdor too, were it not so? To the selfsame tune and words. Who's here? The king hath happily received, Macbeth, the news of thy success. And when he reads thy personal venture in the rebels' fight, his wonders and his praises do contend which should be thine or his. Silenced with that, 
in viewing over the rest of the self same day, he finds thee in the stout Norwegian ranks, nothing afeard of what thyself didst make, strange images of death. As thick as tail came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defense, and poured them down before him. Uh, we are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. <laughs> And for an earnest of a greater honor, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Caldor, in which addition, Hail, most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What, can the devil speak true? The Thane of Caldor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both he labored in his country's rack, I know not. But treason's capital confessed and proved have overthrown him. Gloms and Thane of Cawdor. The greatest is behind. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings when those that gave the thane of Cawdor to me promise no less to them? That trusted home might yet enkindle you unto the crown besides the thane of Cawdor. But tis strange, and oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles, to betray us in deepest consequence. Cousins, a word I pray you. Two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. <laughs> I thank you, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good... Why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is... But what is not? Look how our partners wrap. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. New honors come upon him like our strange garments. Cleave not to their mold, but with the aid of use. <laughs> <laughs> come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Ah, give me your favor. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. Think upon what hath chanced, and at more time, the interim having waited, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Very gladly. Till then, enough. Come, friends. Okay, let's have a quick talk about this scene. We'll go up to the beginning. The witches have met again with that drumming at the start of this scene. We are on a heath and we get to know the witches a little bit more here in their dialogue with each other. Let's have a look here. It, this, the first witch is talking about how a sailor's wife was literally munching on chestnuts. And this witch was jealous of that. And because she asked, can you give me some? Give me, I quote, she says here. And this person is quite dismissive and says, you're a witch, aren't thee a witch? And so she doesn't give her chestnuts. The witch, of course, is really offended by this and seeks revenge. So she does this by casting a spell on the husband of this woman because she's angry. That's when she says, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do. She's angry. It might seem trivial to not get the, um, the chestnut, but I think this is just what the witches do. They're quite, um, obviously quite malicious in their, um, charm spinning. 
So the other witches say they're going to help out. Um, and when the sailor, the, the the husband of this woman who didn't give her the chestnut, is out sailing, he's going to drain him dry as hay, I guess, to, to um, dry up the water, their access to water. And check this. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. So he, the charm is going to be also that the sailor doesn't get any sleep, which is interesting because we know later on in the play that Macbeth struggles with sleep. She's not going to kill him. His bark cannot be lost, so that the, the boat's not going to get lost, but she's going to make sure that it's temp tempest tossed. So tempest is a storm. So she's going to cause, cause chaos, really, for this guy's um, sailing trip. Macbeth is here. So they say peace, peace. Here they are, hand in hand, and the charms wound up right as Macbeth turns up. Interesting that earlier they said fair is foul and foul is fair, and I thought it was quite a coincidence here that Macbeth just so happens to say that exact phrase as he's turning up. Banquo gives some awesome imagery here of what these witches look like. It, as I say to my to my class, um, we're not thinking Halloween um, sexy witch. The witches back then were depicted as really quite vulgar. They each have a chappy finger laying on their skinny lips. So all three of them are standing like that. He says, you should be women and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. So it's a bit of a quote there really about gender. These women are hideous, whether they're witches or not, they're hideous. They straight away go into these prophecies. Hail, Thane to Glams. He already is. Then they say, Hail, Thane of Cawdor, which is quite curious because he's thinking, well, how can I be that if he's alive? And finally, the big one, that shall be king, which is quite shocking. Banquo says, why do you start? So clearly it's it's had an impact on Macbeth straight away. Now, but Banquo says, well, what about me? If you can see the seeds of time, if you can look into the seeds of time, tell me what's going to happen. And this is where they give these paradoxical phrases here that are a little bit difficult to decipher. Lesser than Macbeth and greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. You're going to get kings, but you won't be one. So all kind of paradoxical phrases that intrigue not only the audience, but Banquo. Really, really odd that that Macbeth would say stay because we know the attitude towards witches at the time it's pretty negative obviously King James wanted them all dead and um, so it's interesting that Macbeth is extremely curious from the very beginning say from whence you owe this strange intelligence speak I charge you he wants to know more they're shocked because they say, wow, they seemed really real and now they're gone. Banquo even says, have we eaten on the insane route? Have we eaten something that's given us a hallucination? Are we high? The moment is interrupted by the arrival of Ross and Angus who turn up to tell Macbeth, hey, guess what? You're in. You're now Thane of Cawdor because you're so brave and fabulous and the original one was a traitor. So straight away, Macbeth is like, oh, my God, that's what these witches just said to me. They called it. Banquo is even shocked. Can the devil speak true? He is referring to the witches there. What you have here is a lot of, um, oh, sorry, I should say here. This is really a warning from Banquo. It's strange. Often times to win us to our harm so to to mess with us the instruments of darkness i.e the witches 
tell us truths, win us, win us with honest trifles only to betray in deepest consequence. So they'll tell you kind of half truths to win your trust and it is only to betray it. So they are not to be trusted. Meanwhile, Macbeth is talking to himself. He's a little aside here and he is quite um, intrigued but nervous. It cannot be ill. It cannot be good. However, he does begin to see a horrid image in his mind. Perhaps the, the charm that they say is wound up is already taking effect instantaneously, perhaps. Because this image of murder in his mind is so terrifying, it's making his seated heart knock at his ribs. And he knows that it's against nature what he's envisioning. Look, Macbeth's miles away. Banquo even says, my partner's wrapped. He is miles away. I highlighted this because one of the themes in the play is time. So in your notes, do come back to that. When we get more time, I'll go there. Um, give me a favour, my dull brain, <laughs> brain was wrought with things forgotten. He's saying, don't mind me, sorry, I'm miles away. I'm back with you now. Little do the other men know he's miles away picturing murder. Is execution done on Cawdor? Are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back. But I have spoke with one that saw him die who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons implored your highness pardon and set forth a deep repentance nothing in his life became him like the leaving it he died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as to a careless trifle there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face he was a gentleman on whom i built an absolute trust oh worthiest cousin the sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee, and will labor to make thee full of growing. Ah. Noble Banquo, that hast no less deserved, nor must be known, and no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee and hold thee to my heart. Ah. There, if I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. <laughs> Sons, kinsmen, thames, and you whose places are the nearest, know we will establish our estate upon our eldest, Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland. Which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers. From hence to Inverness, and bind us further to you. The rest is labor which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So humbly take my leave. My worthy Cawdor! The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap, for in my way it lies. Stars, hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. True, worthy Banquo, he is full so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let's after him, 
whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. So we're at the palace. We have um, King Duncan, who's asking if the execution is done for the previous Cordor, Thane of Cordor. Um, he, obviously, I thought he was dead before, but he wasn't. He confessed his treasons and he did ask to be pardoned. He died as one that had been studying his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed. So suddenly when this man was about to be executed, he um, appeared, um, you know, remorseful. And it's interesting that King Duncan says there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. And what he's saying here is critical to big themes in the play, which is about deception, um, masking, your true intent, betrayal, and uh, mistrust. So what he's saying is you can't tell what the hell's going on in someone's mind based on their face. They might be smiling at you and they want you dead because he's just learned the hard way, Duncan has. I ha he absolutely trusted him, the original Thane of Cordor, and he betrayed him. So this really links, this one really links to um, the attitudes of the time or the values because there was a lot of upheaval politically where there was assassination attempts by people that you would have trusted. So we've got um, Duncan saying here, like, we cannot pay you enough for the brilliant work you did, Macbeth. And he says, it's all good. It pays itself, man. I'm just so happy to do my duty. Um, for your throne, so it's all good. I do it for love and honour. So then we have Duncan declare that the next in line to be uh, to be the king is Malcolm, his son. He declares this publicly, and Macbeth seems all good here, but then. And here we have one of his sneaky asides, which means to himself. And he says, the Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or overleap. So think of actual steps to being the king up here. He's like, how can I get right up there quickly? I'm either going to tumble down it this metaphorical staircase, or I'm going to have to overleap literally everything to get up there. He says here, stars, he talks directly to the stars, hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. In our class, we talked about light, he's talking up there to the stars. And we thought light is really a representation of heaven. And he doesn't want the heavens to see these desires that he has. They're quite dark, as he says, and he is aware that it's the wrong thing to do and he knows it's a sin. So he wants to be able to commit this act without the judgment of heaven above. They met me in the day of success. And I have learned by the perfectest report, they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air, into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king, who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me, and referred me to the coming on of time with Hail King that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. 
Glums thou art, and Cawdor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou wholly. Wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have, great gloms, that which cries, Thus thou must do, if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do than wishest should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou'rt mad to say it. Is not thy master with him, who, were it so, would have informed for preparation? So please you, it is true. Our thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him, who, almost dead for breath, had scarcely more than would make up his message. Give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is hoarse, that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief, come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, Hold! Hold! Great gloms, worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter, thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present. And I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Uh, Your face, my Thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time, bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We will speak further. Only look up clear. To alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. Ooh, okay. (laughs) Okay, let's talk through... Of this scene. Okay, we start. We start with Lady Macbeth here reading the letter that Macbeth has sent to her. He talks. He speaks of they. They met me in the day of success, meaning the witches. And he's talking about when he uh, met them on the heath. And he talks through what they told him, and that hey, it's actually starting to come true. So it's only logical that this one about being king will be true as well. The letter finishes here and Lady Macbeth 
is, as she says down here, quite transported by this information. And she straight away says, you shall be what you've been promised. But she is fearful and she's fearful that, um, that he is too weak. She says his nature is too full of the milk of human kindness. It's the second time we've heard um, the word milk. And this is a feminine thing. And it's a weakness. It's a weak thing in this play, really. She, he's too full of the milk of human kindness. She's saying that he would be great and he's not without ambition. He is an ambitious guy. But she's saying that he just doesn't have that kind of, um, she says, the illness, that kind of vibe in him that would allow him to be really great. And so she says she can't wait for him to come home so she can pour her spirits into his ear and chastise anything that impedes him from the crown. So she's going to shut any insecurities down within him so that he can get that crown. In comes the messenger saying, hey, guess what? Duncan's coming here bloody tonight. And she can't believe I've got to get everything sorted. And she realizes, oh, my God, this is our chance. So this is a, one of her... Um, one of her famous soliloquies, I'd say her most famous moment. And she says that she's hearing the raven croaking the fatal entrance of Duncan. So he's coming tonight. She addresses the spirits, come you spirits and unsex me here. This is again, a kind of reference to wanting to reject um, her femininity in order to um, to be violent and to get this job done. She wants to be filled from the crown, so that would be up here, to her toes, so her whole body. She needs to be filled with the direst of cruelty. In order to get this job done, she has to be brutal. She even says to these spirits, stop up the access and passage to remorse. Think of it like a plug. You're wanting to plug this so that remorse can't come out. She does not want to feel remorse. And this would have been quite confronting for Jacobean audiences at the time when she says, come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gold. So she's wanting the milk to be replaced with um, poison or bile is what gall means. So something disgusting either way. In order to get this done, she's going to really transform herself. But just like Macbeth, when he says, stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. She also has this element of secrecy to it She's into doing it, but she wants it to be hidden away behind a smoke of hell. Cover me in the dunnest smoke of hell. She doesn't want, she outright says, I don't want heaven to peep through the blanket of dark and cry, hold, hold, i.e. stop. So these actions are going to occur in darkness because the last thing anybody wants is a conscience or remorse or heaven saying stop. She says the letters have transported me. I mean, she's, she's really in, in the zone now. Macbeth is not fully committed to the plan here, but she starts to instruct him. She notices that his face is giving him away because his face is like a book. 
where men read strange matters. You have to fake it, essentially. And she's saying you have to have welcome in your eye. With her classic line here, with a simile and then a metaphor of look like the innocent flower, but be, so there's the metaphor, the serpent under it. Serpent obviously being um, a symbol for evil, going right back to biblical allusions there. He must be provided for, and she says, the, the, we'll notice that the word, that the act of murder is often called the business. And she says, leave it to me. Leave all the rest to me. Because he says, we'll speak further. We will talk later. He's not fully committed yet. It's about to be at scene six before Macbeth's castle. So quick backtrack. Macbeth has sent Lady Macbeth a letter to say, hey, I'm thinking I could be king. I'm envisioning murder. Lady Macbeth is into it. She says, let's sort it out tonight because Duncan is coming. Can you shut that for me, please? Sandy, this is a question to test you. See how you go. Can you recall what Macbeth refers to Malcolm as being? He's something he needs to overcome. How does he refer to Malcolm? If you can't remember, we'll help you. Something that you're going to go from here to there on. Stairs. A stair to over to overleap. A step. Can somebody please recall a quote off the top of your head from Lady Macbeth? Hands up only. Yes. Uh, flower serpent under it. <laughs> flower serpent under it quote. Do you are you able can anyone say the flower serpent under it quote in full? Louder, please. Look like the flower, but be the serpent under it. Remember, she characterizes the flower, a key word. Innocent. Thank you. Innocent, loving this. This guest of summer, the temple haunting martlet, does approve by his love to mansionry. But the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. Mm. No jutty, freeze, buttress, nor coin of that. A keynote I'm making there, Tim, is dramatic irony in that we, the audience, know something that the characters don't. Who is Duncan? He's the king. He's arriving and he gets to Macbeth's house and he says, This is gorgeous. This castle's got a really pleasant seat. The air recommends itself. We, the audience, go, you're actually walking towards your death. So it's, it is dramatic irony. And it's for this bird has made a tender bed and procreant cradle. But in those breed and haunts, I have observed the air is delicate. See, see, see our honoured hostess, <laughs> the love that follows us sometimes is our trouble, which still we thank as love. <laughs> Herein I teach you how you shall bid Gardildas for your pains and thank us for your trouble. <laughs> All our service, in every point twice done and then done double, were poor and single business to contend against those honours deep and broad wherewith your majesty loathes our house. For those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermits. <laughs> Where's the fame of Cawdor? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor. But he rides well, and his great love, sharp as his spur, hath helped him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. Ah, oh, your servants ever have theirs, themselves, and what is theirs in comp to make their audit at your highness' pleasure, still to return your own. Give me your hand. Conduct me to my host. We love him highly, and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. If it were done when it is done, then to a well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, 
that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instructions, which being taught, return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off and pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, the tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. I'll know what you. Can anyone remember? the name for a long period of text like that excellent so we have here another pretty big soliloquy from Macbeth this totally where he's musing to himself here he makes a comment here that we're taught we're taught violence I mean when is this set when is this? That's when it's published. When is it set, though? That's when it's published, the 10th. So this is the medieval time. It's all right, it's all right. It's a good guess. It's the medieval period, guys. Warfare is extremely violent. This is pre-gunpowder, so it's all swords and daggers. I did Google that one year because I was like, wait, why not guns yet? It was a little bit later for gunpowder. So he's musing that we are taught violence. So is it any surprise that I am becoming violent in my um, in my quest for power? Guys, what might double trust mean? Double trust. Have a have a guess. Have you ever heard someone say that she's a two faced bitch? What might that mean? A friend who goes behind your back. So double trust is meaning there's two parts of it. On the one hand, you're trustworthy, but he doesn't know the true. Two-faced, yeah, absolutely. What's he struggling with here, guys, internally? He says, as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife himself, myself, What's he struggling against there? Have a go, Eleanor, yep. Absolutely second guessing it. Yeah. Absolutely. This is that double trust idea. In the exam, guys, if you only remembered the phrase double trust, that's a great quote to have. Duncan is at the castle in double trust. Yeah, he says I should be the host, not bearing the knife myself. Pity like a naked newborn babe. We have to go back, guys. One of the big themes here is gender. You'll notice that Macbeth really struggles with being a man because his wife is so brutal. <laughs> so she often overpowers his masculinity and takes the ch takes charge. He's saying that pity is, um, to have pity for people is weak. Final section from here. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent. What is a spur? Does anyone know this? To prick the sides, what might you be pricking the side of? Hell yeah, nice one. You know those things? That's the best I can do with my tablet. And you're kicking 
a horse in order to what? Like make it, absolutely, to make it go faster. He says, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition. So he's being driven right now by vaulting ambition. What does it mean to vault? To jump over. Pole vaulting, I think it is a horse thing as well. His ambition is overleaping itself and it's falling on the other. He's got no spur to, to egg him on here. Who might act as that spur? Lady Macbeth. Funny that she's coming in right now. I think she'll act as the spur. <laughs> We will proceed no further in this business. He has honoured me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. The Pope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? And wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteems the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat of the adage? Pretty peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail. We fail? But screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, whereto the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the water of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbeck only. When in swinish sleep their drenched natures lies as in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Bring forth men children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Mm -hmm. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers that they have done? Who dares receive it other, as we shall make our griefs and clamour roar upon his death? I am settled, and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible fate. Away, and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. <laughs> Let's just have a little look at some of those chunks there, guys. We see here that Macbeth chickens out with that quote, we will proceed no further with this business. Uh, he's quite emphatic there. I'm out. I don't want to do this. He says, I'm actually getting golden opinions from all sorts of people. He's saying, everyone loves me right now. Let's not blow it. Like, we're, we're in a good spot. Let's not screw it up. She is saying, were you, who the hell are you? I thought you were wanting to do this. H are you asleep? Were you drunk when you first started talking about this? Don't be a wimp now. So she's actually using, Shakespeare's using some imagery here. Why would we, um, why would he say that Macbeth looks green and pale? What do those colours of a face usually indicate? Guilt. Guilt? Yeah, we're saying sick, yeah. Sick, but also what? So green and pale. So green is for sick, yeah? 
have you fear shock is usually when we go pale so guys all ready for the exam you've got this idea of shakespeare uses imagery to describe macbeth's fear before they fully commit to the plan green and pale he says we're not doing it how does she get him back on path then to do it right here this chunk is quite important how does she get him to commit to the plan again? Samantha's in this chunk. In the bottom half, she's talking about some violent stuff. Focus on the top half. What does she sort of manipulate him with? Go for it, Ali. Is she challenging his masculinity? You're absolutely right. Can you see where she's doing that? Yeah, when you do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you are, you would be so much more the man. So she is absolutely talking about his masculinity. She's, she's telling him, I'm going to view you as even more of a strong man if you do this. If you weren't thinking that Lady Macbeth is hardcore, you should now. <laughs> What imagery do we get in that second half, guys, down here? Is anyone willing to just describe what imagery we're getting? Yes. She is talking about breastfeeding, and what is she saying she has done in the past? She's actually saying here, guys, that she's she knows how tender it is to give the babe um, that milks me she is so hardcore she's saying i am if i commit to something i would even rip that baby from her nipple and dash its brains out this is why we're talking about this because sometimes it can fly over your head she is saying don't be such a wimp macbeth i have given suck and I know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me, but I would, if I had sworn to you that I'd do it, then I would do it. I would rip it. Even while its smiling face was looking up at her, she'd pluck it from her nipple and she'd dash its brains out. What does this tell us about her? Answer quickly. Say that again. <laughs> You're so... That's nice of you. I'm gonna I'm putting a question mark at driven. She's a real boss woman, is it boss lady? We're saying what was yours, Gus? Ruthless. I'm gonna go for that one as a bit stronger, but I know what you mean there, Sasha. She's got a she knows what she wants. She's ruthless and guys, of course, she's also violent. Also underpinning all this, guys. Manipulative. She knows exactly what to do with her husband to get him on board. Macbeth, what characterization do you get from that line? If we should fail, what does that tell us about Macbeth? Pardon it? Yeah, in himself, yeah. So I'm just going to put that as some insecurity. Guys, it's really critical that we know this stuff. What is the plan? I won't make notes there, but what's the plan? How are they killing in his sleep, who are they going to get blind drunk? The two guards. What daggers are they going to use? The guards. Why? So it looks like the guards did it. And then, of course, the ultimate plan is the next day we'll make our grief and clamour roar. So we'll be like, oh, my God, Duncan. <sighs> Great. Macbeth's in. He says, yes, we're doing it. And it ends here, guys. Do you remember that phrase, double trust? False faced must hide what the false heart doth know. So this idea of duality and um, lies, double, it connects to that idea of double trust. Flower and serpent, trustworthy and untrustworthy. Yeah. Which line? Where's that? Oh, that means exit. I don't know why it's like that. Exit, next scene. Is that act one done? 
Legends, let's take a, f a little minute break and keep rolling.